Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our next session. And uh, I have a very, very special guest with me here today. Thank you so much for joining us. However, first and foremost, um, did you know that India's story is a 10,000-year-old epic, so I'm told? And we are incredibly lucky to be joined by the member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India. And you're also an economist, a historian, a writer, and an author, and uh, you are here to tell us exactly what has shaped the story of India. So, a very warm welcome to Sanjeev Sanyal. Thank you so much. Pleased to be here. Right. I think we're going to dive straight into Western media. Okay. What, just dive straight in there. Um, what do you think? What do you think Western media gets wrong about India? And especially as Western media is very sort of very watchful in terms of, of, of political and global affairs here as well. What do you think they get wrong and how does this type of coverage change perceptions of the country as well? So let me say that my views on this have evolved over time. So in the till if you ask me five, six years ago. I would have said they are misinformed and they need to be educated. But over time, I've come to the conclusion that it is not a lack of information. Uh, and education is not going to improve anything. Because basically, it is driven by certain agenda. It may be ideological, it may be corporate interests, it may be uh, you know, all kinds of other reasons. But it is not because they don't have the correct information. They just want to tell a particular story, and they're going to tell that anyway. And that really came across to me when, during the uh, COVID lockdown, there was, as you know, there was a lot of disruption uh, everywhere in the world, and I was kind of like the unofficial spokesperson of the finance ministry at that time, and you know, I was trying to explain to the media um, how we were managing our uh, economy. Now, today everybody agrees that it, we did a good job, but at that time it wasn't clear. And there, is a, there was a New York Times uh, journalist who decided to interview me, and unknown to her, I recorded the whole uh, session. And then I put it up on YouTube, so any of you can listen to it as well. So if you listen to it, you will see it's a one hour long conversation in which the journalist is trying repeatedly to put words in my mouth. There is literally no interest in understanding what I'm saying. They're just trying to uh, trip me up to say something which they would then quote. It's a different matter, I recorded the whole thing and put it up in YouTube, and it, it became uh, quite a bestseller in its own right. But I'm just telling you, I don't think um, it's a matter of education. The good news is twofold. First of all, the Western media actually no longer drives perceptions of India, or anything indeed, in the West. Because most ordinary people, or even opinion makers in the West, do not derive their opinions from their own media. Otherwise, you know, President Trump would not be on a comeback trail right now if you went by the media reports, right? So mm -hmm. since they do not believe anything in their own countries, they do not consequently believe what they say about India either. The second thing is, there are now lots of different avenues of getting your story out. So there's obviously social media of all kinds, Twitter, etc. cetera. Um, uh, then you have uh, podcasts. Uh, you have events like this, uh, and so uh, what I have found is that uh, as a country, the, more, the better use of our time is to actually directly reach out using social media, using events, reaching out to universities, reaching out to investors, and so on. And you can see a palpable change in the narrative of India with very little change in the coverage of India in the media. So it tells you very clearly that actually we shouldn't bother so much with what the Western media says at all. So you're quite untrusting when it comes to, to Western media, or media, I suppose, in general, and you think- I just come to the conclusion it's, a, it's a irrelevant now. And as you said, agenda-driven, basically. Yes. But as you said, you know, the rise of social media, it really has completely changed the media landscape. And as you said, you can reach different segments, and it's, a, it's your own narrative at the end of the day as well. Um, what about you know, recent anti-India sentiments? Do you think it's from uh, misconceptions or a lack of understanding? And do you think that India's got to stand up for itself in some respect? Or is it just business as usual, like just carry on? So as I said, um, 
a lot of the coverage is not a misunderstanding. It is deliberate, um, agenda-driven narratives. And this is done in all kinds of ways. We discuss the media, but there are all kinds of other ways in which it is done. For example, you know, <clears throat> there is now a proliferation of these think tanks, uh, again, mostly in the West, who uh, now routinely come up with these global rankings of everything on Earth. And in all of them, almost, India does spectacularly badly. So for example, if you have the Global Democracy Index, you know, we'll be lucky if you know, the world's democracy uh, gets ranked anything above 90. OK, there'll be the Global Academic Freedom Index, in which, ironically, India is ranked below Afghanistan. And then there is the World Media Freedom Index, in which also we are below Afghanistan and Pakistan. So I'm, what I'm trying to say is not, there's not even a pretense of trying to be fair to India. Now, historically, what we used to do is to try and explain to these think tanks and so on. Uh, I've written myself lots of papers. Some of you have read it in the newspapers, etc., showing how their methodology is absolute garbage. And uh, yet, uh, these, these are still done. So, you know, what, what can we do about it? One is, as I said, we, this lives in the world of social media. Um, we actually talk to the investors. Uh, we actually talk to you know, uh, academia, we actually talk to the general population, and there's been a palpable change in India's image internationally, irrespective of these um, sort of think tanks, media, and so on. And so my own view is that the time has come, one is keep doing what we are doing, succeed. The best antidote to the, all of this is to actually succeed. The second is, at some point in time, India and more generally the global south will have to build up its own think tanks, its own uh, capability of creating indices, rankings, etc., and basically be able to reverse the gaze. Until this is done, we will have to use other media, but basically we should not pander to this. That's the main point I'm making. There is no real reason to pander to it. So Reaching out to sort of different areas globally, do you think the global perception that's on social media and are using different avenues, they have quite a good perception then? Absolutely. I mean, the Honorable Prime Minister himself has some 78 million followers on Twitter alone. Um, why does he need a, some broadcasting corporation or something to, to be talking about him? He can, he can say whatever he wants to say directly. Um, so, how do you think that the growing Indian diaspora across the world has also changed perceptions and the narrative of India as well? It has in multiple ways. I mean, obviously, the success of India's diaspora globally um, has, has, has changed things. And I'll tell you how it has changed. If you went back to the early, uh, uh, to the early 90s, uh, as recently as the early 90s, Indian diaspora was seeing as poor immigrants coming to the country, somehow trying to make their lives. By the 2000s, that image changed, okay, these are the IT guys. So it still happens to me occasionally, I'm in some airport somewhere in the world, and somebody will walk up to me and say, you know, my computer isn't working, can you do something about it? And, you know, assuming that I actually understand anything about it. And by the way, switching it on and off works. <laughs> <clears throat> That has also now moved on. We have our Im image has changed further because as Indian CEOs uh, have gone and gone on to lead some of the biggest companies in the world, uh, the UK and many other countries now have Indian origin uh, prime ministers and presidents and so on. So I think over time that image has changed and, uh, and, and that has reflected back to um, how Indians are perceived back in India mm -hmm. because you know much of this had at the back of their mind certain preconceived colonial era images, uh, um, certain, you know, with culturally loaded images of what Indians are, and their obvious success outside of India does reflect back in the, to the mother country. Well, as one of the key policymakers that actually runs the India, Indian economy, um, the economy, as we've seen, you know, has rapidly evolved. You are literally the world's fastest major economy in the world right now. So how has that evolution reshaped as well, the, the narrative, and what are the implications when it comes to future growth as well? What do you think is going to happen off the back of that? 
Well, size matters in terms of your narrative because other people are trading with you, they are investing in you, your geopolitical uh, sort of bulk goes up. So there's no doubt that India's image in very recent times, particularly coming out of COVID, has completely changed. Um, and so, uh, you know, obviously we will be in the next 24 months or so the, become the world's third largest economy. We are the world's fastest economy uh, already by some margin. So this matters, but let me give you an, another area where we have just in the last six months established itself uh, geopolitically. Um, not many people, even in India, realize that um, the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, that entire trade route is basically currently functioning because of the Indian Navy. And so what it has done is out of the bat, India has become kind of the uh, single most important security provider in, uh, you know, the Red Sea, uh, Arabian Sea area. And so as we evolve as a, as a major security provider in the Indian Ocean region, you know, India is playing a geopolitical role which even a year ago people would not have imagined we would be playing. In fact, we would all, ourselves not have imagined we are playing. But we are playing it. So we are beginning to fill out spaces uh, as we become bigger. And um, others recognize it. And of course, the idea is now to build uh, partnerships with others mm -hmm. so that, uh, you know, we, I mean, we would like to go on this long journey and we would like to have our friends along with us. So what does that long journey look like? What is the sort of next chapter when it comes to India's global narrative? See, it's one thing to be the world's third largest economy, but do remember we are the world's largest population. So when you divide one by the other, we still remain a very poor country. So we have to sustain this performance for 25 years. Only then are we going to get to the bottom echelons of being a developed country in you know, 2047, when we will be 100 years of freedom. So <clears throat> this is a big effort we have to do, and we can't slip it up, right? This is, this is an opportunity. But at the end of that process, remember, even we will begin to age, just like China is aging today in 25 years, we will also begin to age. So this is our opportunity. We have to make it work. So very important, we remain focused on economic growth. We remain focused on um, sort of building out uh, India of our dreams and not get uh, distracted by other things. Uh, it also, of course, means that we have to keep doing reforms. See, growth is not some... Uh, God-given thing that happens naturally. It has to be earned. And so that means that you have to keep doing reforms all the time. So the last 25 years of reforms has got us here. We have another 25 years of reforms going ahead. And a lot of difficult things need to be done. So we have done some things, difficult things included. But there are things like, for example, we need to do something about uh, our judicial system. Uh, enforcement of contracts is a serious issue in this country. Uh, we've heard other speakers also uh, allude to that. But really, we need a judicial system meant for the 21st century, not one which is stuck in the 19th century. And so this is a huge area of reform. Of course, the government can only do a little bit. The judiciary itself has to get on with it and do something about it. Um, but the government, for example, needs to also upgrade the, and reform the administration and the bureaucracy. Um, so the last 25 years of progress has been essentially by weakening the bureaucracy's ability to stifle growth, uh, but it hasn't meant that the bureaucracy itself has been reformed. Mm. But now we need to reform it so that it begins to deliver the services it's supposed to do. We need a 21st century bureaucracy that requires administrative reforms, something that's been discussed for last half a century, but we, now we need to get on with it and do it. So that's another one. Uh, another major area that we need to work on is on municipal reforms, uh, delivery of you know, urban services, uh, so the last decade, we have worked very hard on intra-city uh, infrastructure, you know, highways, airports, and so on. Now we need, we are now focusing on intra-city uh, in, uh, infrastructure. So we are shifting from intercity to intra-city infrastructure. Mumbai is one of the first places we are working on this. Uh, but, you know, it is, it, it's, it's a big area of work that we need to work on. Well, as obviously this is the investment forum, what, what in your mind are the sort of key Key, the most exciting areas of investment when it comes to, uh, to India, maybe Mumbai in particular as well? Well, I have a, a philosophical problem with answering that question. 
I, I, I am a strong believer that policy makers should not be deciding where investment should be made. People in the audience, there are lots of entrepreneurs in there. You know what to invest on. My job is to make sure the government provides the infrastructure and then keeps out of the way. So I will pass that question uh, because I, I believe it's not my job to decide uh, or, the, or the job of any government official to decide where this economy should go. Um, let the entrepreneurs do their job. My job is to keep the overall system running while they take their risks. Very well said. Uh, we only have a couple of seconds left, but do you have a key message? As obviously we have a lot of people online watching us uh, and obviously our audience here, and that's how you like to, to speak to people obviously as well. So what was your sort of key final takeaway and message for our audience here today? So my message is, look, India, this is an exciting time to be in India. Um, and we, in as policymakers, uh, are absolutely determined to keep India on track. Obviously, as I mentioned, we have to do the difficult reforms of the, of the next few decades. And we are all uh, on this together, not just Indians, but you know, our partners around the world. Um, we uh, want your uh, investment. We want to, uh, your feedback. Uh, if there are new areas or uh, policies you need uh, relooking, we are our doors are open. We would be very happy to, um, you know, uh, relook at anything. Um, you know, as I said, uh, we will uh, do what is necessary to get to being a developed country by the year 2047. Very, very well said. We cannot thank you enough for your words of wisdom here today. Thank you so much to Sanjeev Samuel. Thank you. Thank you.